Hello, my name is Gordon Doig from the University of Sydney in Australia. Today I'm going to talk about early parental nutrition in critical illness. What the evidence really says. Today's talk is going to be primarily based on the results of a major clinical trial that we conducted at 31 hospitals throughout Australia and New Zealand that we published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2013. The results of this project have been presented at at least 11 international meetings. The purpose of today's YouTube presentation is to allow people who are unable to attend these meetings to gain a better understanding of what we did, why we did it, and what we found. Before we begin, I think it's very important for you to understand that this study was funded by a major research grant from the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council. We did receive unrestricted academic grants from Fresenius Kabi and from Baxter Healthcare, and Fresenius Kabi Australia supplied the study parental nutrition. However, neither of our industry partners played any role in designing the study, interpreting the results, or censoring the publications. So in this presentation, I'm going to give you a brief understanding of why we undertook the study. I'm going to talk about essential elements of study design. For example, we're going to go into the study PN dosing protocol in some detail. We're going to talk about all of the major results and then summarize. So context, why did we do this study? In 2008, we published the results of a project that evaluated an evidence-based guideline that was implemented at 27 hospitals throughout Australia and New Zealand. This guideline is important because I want you to understand that Australia and New Zealand are pro entro nutrition countries. This is an algorithmic presentation of the guideline that we developed and evaluated. And you can see right here that our major recommendation is for entro nutrition to be started within 24 hours of ICU admission. These are the results of implementing our guideline across 14 hospitals. So these are 561 patients who are fed according to our guideline. And the most important result here is by day two, within 24 hours of ICU admission, 77% of patients are being fed enterally. This is as good as or better than any other country in the world. So we're very pro entro nutrition. But instead of focusing on how well we were doing with entro nutrition, when my team received these results, we looked at these patients. We wanted to understand why these patients weren't being fed, what we could do to feed them better. They were unfed for an average of 3.8 days during their ICU stay. To understand how we could care for these patients better, we did a systematic review of all available evidence with a focus on the potential role for parental nutrition in these patients. What we found as a result of the systematic review of all available evidence was that in patients who could not receive early EN, early parental nutrition resulted in a significant reduction in mortality, but there was a trend or suggestion of an increase in infectious complications. When we showed this evidence to clinicians, the majority of clinicians looked at this evidence and said, this is very interesting but there are not a lot of patients included in all these clinical trials, and we're concerned about the suggestion of an increase in infectious complications. This reduction in mortality, combined with a potential increase in infectious complications, provided equipoise for a large-scale clinical trial. So we propose that in patients who have short-term relative contraindications to early enteronutrition, perhaps the provision of early parental nutrition will reduce mortality and associated measures of morbidity compared to pragmatic standard care. We submitted a major grant to the NH and MRC, and we received funding to conduct a study at 31 hospitals throughout Australia and New Zealand. We recruited these patients from 2006 
to 2011, and we enrolled 1,363 critically ill ICU patients. These are the complete inclusion criteria. We focused on adult patients who were in the ICU for less than 24 hours. At the time of screening, we wanted to ensure that they were expected to remain in ICU today and tomorrow, so they were not having a discharge scheduled. We also wanted to ensure that they were not expected to receive enteral, parenteral, or oral intake today or tomorrow, and that they already had a central venous line through which parental nutrition could be delivered. So this meant that we used a central line as a measure of severity of illness because they already had a line in place. And before we considered them for the study, we negotiated access to one of the lumens in the line in case they were randomized to parental nutrition. The study intervention was a generic ready-to-mix three-chamber bag that contained a reasonable amount of protein in the form of amino acids, a reasonable amount of glucose, and a lipid that had no special characteristics. So we wanted to use a generic product in this study. Starting rates and daily rate increases for the study PN were defined by study protocols de designed to reflect normal care in Australia and New Zealand. Fiona Simpson and I visited all potential sites before we started the study, and we asked them how they started PN, how they set their targets, how they increased. So we used this knowledge to design the study protocol to represent standard care in Australia and New Zealand. And this was our PM protocol that applied to all patients except malnourished patients. 60 mils an hour was the median starting rate of parenteral nutrition based on our hospital visits. So our protocol recommended commencing at 60 mils an hour on day one, increasing to 80 mils an hour on day two, and increasing to goal rate by study day three. Notice that we made a strong recommendation for enteral or oral nutrition on day three in our PM protocol. We did not want this to be a long-term study of long-term PN. We wanted to transition patients to enteral nutrition or oral intake as early as possible. By day four, we explicitly recognize that the study protocol can end and that if you wish, you can switch the patient to your regular hospital parental nutrition with goals set according to your regular hospital practices. And we also recommend again on day four, trialing enteral or oral intake if clinically appropriate. Here's our protocol for malnourished patients. In our interviews, we realized that clinicians were aware of the risk of refeeding syndrome in high, highly malnourished patients and that they traditionally started parental nutrition slower and progressed to lower targets. So we started these patients at a much lower rate. We strongly recommended thiamine. Day two rate was again much lower. And the target rate achieved or goal rate achieved by day three was much lower than protocol A. Here, again, we recommend transitioning to enteral or oral intake. By day four, you could tr transition to your normal hospital PN. And we also uh, recommended trace elements and minerals on each day. And finally, transitioning to EN was recommended again on day four. So that's our protocol for delivering parental nutrition in the study. I talked about achieving goals by day three. Day three goals were calculated using the Harris-Benedict equation. We, do, we use total caloric content, including protein calories of the study PN to calculate PN infusion rates. Metabolic needs for obese patients were defined, uh, defined as a BMI greater than 30, were calculated based on ideal body weight, and we capped all calculations from Harris-Benedict to an upper limit of 30 kcals per kilogram per day. We used a study web tool 
for all calculations. This is just uh, the Harris Benedict implemented in a web calculator specifically for this study. And we ordered our stress factors for selection from least to most severe. And you can see right at the top, although the target is lower, malnutrition with a high risk of refeeding system was ranked as the most severe. So we we're very cautious in setting our targets for all patients. Calculated target metabolic needs were usually achieved on study day three. We did not specify the study to be used to re-estimate targets from day four on. However, we did recommend that reasonable ranges should be achieved. Standard care patients receive standard care. We did not protocolize standard care at all. We let the attending clinicians select the route, starting rate, metabolic targets, measures of tolerance, and composition of fees to be used in standard care patients based on current practice in their ICU. So who got into the trial? The main type of patients who were enrolled were patients with a GI perforation who are managed surgically. Many, many surgeons are concerned about feeding across an anastomosis. There is reasonable evidence that feeding enterally across an anastomosis actually speeds healing of the anastomosis, but still 17% uh, of our patients enrolled had a GI perforation that was managed surgically. A lot of patients also had GI obstruction that was either managed surgically or medically, and you can understand why these patients were not fed early enterally. Retro AAA patients who often present in a shock state. Many uh, surgeons are reluctant to feed these patients. Patients with GI neoplasm. Other GI patients who are managed surgically. Sepsis, other than urinary tract. Patients with a GI bleed. And overall, 65% of patients were surgical and 35% of patients were medical. Many people point to the fact that this is not an even 50-50 split, but if you look at these patient populations, they're representative of patients who are not fed early enterally. And 65-35 is very close to a 50-50 patient split. The mortality of the overall cohort of patients was 22%. Their average ICU, was, average ICU stay was 8.9 days and their average hospital stay was 25 days. So this is a true critically ill patient population. Now let's look at how these patients were fed. Of the 681 patients randomized to early parental nutrition, 99.7% commenced parental nutrition 44 minutes after enrollment. Approximately 60% of these patients progressed to enter nutrition four days after PN start. So remember our protocol actually recommended trialing EN on day three and day four, because we did not want this to be a study of long-term PN. Let's look at our standard care patients. 29% of these patients commenced EN two days after enrollment. 5.5 days later, 24% of these patients also receive supplemental PN. If you look at all major guidelines, this practice is consistent with following up to achieve targets by supplementing PN by day seven of ICU stay. 27% of patients randomized to standard care actually started parental nutrition two days after enrollment. So a decision was made that they couldn't receive EN, so they were started on PN first. 43% of these patients eventually progressed to EN five days after PN start. So these are not long-term PN patients. And interestingly, 40% of all patients in the pragmatic standard care never received EN or PN during their 3.7 day ICU stay. So this is representative of the type of patients that we initially saw in our guideline study who did not receive early EN. This is another process measure. This is energy intake by study day. 
The black dots are the patients randomized to receive early PN, and these are the standard care patients. Intake on day one looks like it's very low. However, you have to remember that all of these patients are enrolled on their first day of ICU stay, on average 14 hours into their ICU stay. So this is only half a day of feeding. So they got, in reality, about 800 kcals over an entire day, but they're only fed for half a day. What's most important to take away from this figure is on each of the first one, two, three, four, five, six study days, early PN patients receive significantly more energy on each day. So early PN patients were fed more. Here's our patient characteristics. The average age of enrolled patients was about 68. 40% were women. The average BMI was about 28. The average Apache 2 score was about 21 and 80% of enrolled patients were mechanically ventilated at time of enrollment. There were no significant differences in baseline imbalance, but we used a pre-specified algorithm to identify baseline characteristics for inclusion in a multivariate model that addressed age, gender, BMI, Apache 2 score, uh, chronic liver disease, chronic respiratory disease, and source of admission to the ICU. When we look at our primary outcome, deaths before study day 60, on our crude analysis, we can see the rate difference, 22% mortality in standard care, 21% mortality in early PN, no significant difference between groups. When we covariate adjust for the characteristics that I present below here, we can see there is no significant difference between groups. And in fact, our estimate of difference changes to 0.0% difference between groups. Now let's look at infectious complications because clinicians were concerned about the potential for increasing infections. We use the most robust and reliable definitions of infectious complications we could afford to implement in this clinical trial. We're going to go through these one by one no suggestion of an increase in catheter-related infections, no suggestion of an increase in surgical wound infections, no difference in bloodstream infections, abdominal infections, clinically significant UTIs, or airway or lung infections. You might look over here and see that this is getting close to a trend which might concern you, but if you look at the rates, there's no suggestion that early PN results in more infections here. We also use two more stringent definitions of pneumonia. And when we bring them all together, again, no suggestion of an increase in infectious complications. We also classified our infections based on a criteria that allowed us to identify major infections and pool major infections, such as confirmed pneumonia and bloodstream infections. And when we look at any major infection, we see no suggestion of an increase in infectious complications attributable to the use of parental nutrition. Now, this is a very interesting finding. We conducted an assessment of a quality of life measure. Uh, the RAND 36 is the generic version of the SF 36. We conducted the interview by telephone at day 60 follow-up, and we found a significant difference in self-reported quality of life at study day 60. Patients who received early parental nutrition reported significantly better general health. Now, we were very conservative when we employed this measure in this clinical trial, and ahead of time in our statistical analysis plan, we defined a minimally important difference in general health status as a 13.5 unit difference between groups. And if you look at these two groups here, there's approximately a six point difference between groups. So this did not qualify for a big enough difference for us to declare that this outcome was clinically meaningful to patients.
However, the very first time I presented the results of this study, the session was chaired by the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine and the section editor of JAMA. At the end of my presentation, the section editor of JAMA, Derek Angus, put his hand up and he said, let's go back to your quality of life measure. And he asked me a question, but I think he was making a statement at the same time. His question was, did you know that the magnitude of difference that you found is the same magnitude of difference that people who require chronic dialysis report. And we all accept the quality that chronic dialysis has an important effect on people's quality of life. Were you too conservative in setting your threshold at 13.5? So that was his question. Um, I'll leave this up to you to interpret as to whether or not this statistically significant difference in quality of life is clinically meaningful to patients. To, to dialysis patients, this clearly would be. But this is a very interesting finding worth noting. We also found a significant reduction in duration of mechanical ventilation, attributable to receiving early parenteral nutrition. There were no other differences in any of the other outcomes that we assessed, and no hints of differences. The significant reduction in duration of mechanical ventilation translated towards a strong trend towards a reduction in ICU stay, but there was no difference in hospital stay. So in conclusion, our early PN trial randomized patients with the short-term relative contraindication to early EN to receive either pragmatic standard care or parental nutrition provided within 24 hours of ICU admission. We did not find any difference in any measure of mortality, and our best estimate of the effect on mortality is 0.0. We did not find a difference in any type of infectious complications. However, Early PN patients required significantly fewer ventilator days, 1.1 days fewer with a p-value of 0.009, and there was a trend towards a shorter ICU stay of approximately 0.75 days. So our million dollar question is, how could early nutrition reduce duration of ventilation and ICU stay? During our study, we measured body composition changes over time. So every Monday and Thursday that you were in our study, we measured mid-arm muscle circumference and the subjective global assessment of muscle wasting and fat store loss. These are our standard care patients, and this is the subjective global assessment of muscle wasting over time. This is a four-grade scale. And if you look at this graph, you can see that by week five, there has been a one grade change in muscle wasting over time. So this is a, a, a mild to moderate change in muscle wasting over time in standard care patients. These are the patients who received early parenteral nutrition. By repeated measures ANOVA, there was a significant difference between groups, less muscle wasting of approximately 0.16 grade per week. This is the same assessment of fat loss over time. These are the standard care patients. This is change from baseline. And by week five, there's approximately a one grade scale in our scoring system that only has four grades. These are early parental nutrition patients. And you can see that there is a significant difference between groups, less fat loss over time, approximately 0.13 grade per week. So this is mild to moderate evidence of muscle and fat sparing with early PN use. So why is this relevant? This is a fascinating study published in CHEST in 2012. These people used a, a, an ultrasound to measure the thickness of the diaphragm in patients who had been mechanically ventilated for 48 hours. And they found that by 48 hours, they could detect significant thinning representing diaphragmatic muscle mass loss. 
this next study is even more interesting. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. These investigators were a little bit braver. Instead of using an ultrasound, they took biopsies of the diaphragm. And they found, under light microscopy, they could detect diaphragmatic disuse atrophy after only 18 hours of mechanical ventilation. They classified these changes under light microscopy as being consistent with increased proteolysis. And they speculate that by blocking or attenuating, attenuating the diaphragmatic proteolytic pathways in patients on mechanical ventilation, they might mitigate the weaning problems that occur in some patients. So blocking the diaphragmatic breakdown might help people get off the ventilator earlier. Here's a third study that's on exactly the same topic, published in the Blue Journal in 2010. Again, biopsies of the diaphragm, but this time, instead of using light microscopy, they used an electron micrograph. And they were able to categorize the type of proteolytic activity that they saw. And they concluded that they saw a significant increase in the presence of autophagosomes by electron micrograph in their diaphragmatic biopsies after only 15 hours of mechanical ventilation. Now, this is important to understand. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Autophagy is a process that's ongoing in the background all the time. What's unique about it is it's characterized on electron micrograph by these double membrane vesicles. So electron micrographs is very easy to pick up autophagy. The purpose of autophagy is to elimit, uh, eliminate damaged proteins. Our proteins in our body are complex structures. They degrade all the time. Their forms crack, they shift. They no longer perform the functions we need them to perform. So these autophagosomes form around ubiquitin tag protein structures that have been damaged. They digest the proteins down to amino acids and allow the amino acids to be recirculated. Autophagy plays a crucial role in development, differentiation, aging, infection, cancer, and many aspects of normal metabolism. However, autophagy was first described to be induced after nutrient starvation approximately 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, we knew that starvation increased autophagy. And this is because the purpose of autophagy in starvation is to increase proteolytic activity to digest proteins down to amino acids to fuel ATP production through the TCA cycle. So this is a proteolytic activity that increases the availability of amino acids for glucose production. So back to our studies on changes in, in the diaphragm uh, in mechanically ventilated patients. We know that amino acids are the single strongest signal for decreasing autophagy activity. And they decrease autophagy rapidly within 20 minutes and greatly by up to a factor of five. So starvation induces autophagy, amino acids inhibit autophagy. Given evidence of skeletal muscle scaring, uh, given evidence of skeletal muscle sparing, it's entirely plausible that early parenteral nutrition attenuates diaphragmatic proteolysis, mitigating the diaphragmatic loss, which leads to improved weaning. So preservation of muscle mass may explain earlier weaning. We've got a plausible physiologic pathway. We focused on some of the major findings of our trial, but we found no significant harmful effects attributable to the use of early PN in this patient population. So the final question you might have is what about costs? Costs can be harmful too. We understood that people were concerned about the costs of parental nutrition use. So we published 
an economic analysis in a peer review economics journal looking at the cost of using parental nutrition in our clinical trial. We calculated the difference in cost between the two arms in our clinical trial based on the marginal difference in patient outcomes. We based our costs on the best costing paper we can find that was reported in uh, the US healthcare system. It's a database of 51,000 ICU patients from 253 US hospitals. And the reason that this is such a progressive and useful study is, as you can see here, it looks at costs of the major types of ICU patients, whether or not they were mechanically ventilated, and by ICU day. In each patient type, ICU day one is much more expensive than subsequent days. And between the different types of patients, you can see there's a, a huge difference in costs. So this allowed us to create a very accurate cost matrix of the patients who got into our clinical trial. We also needed a good estimate of the cost of parental nutrition. And again, we went to the US healthcare system and we found a major study that looked at the cost of parental nutrition in a database of 44,000 patients from 194 hospitals had at least one transaction level cost recorded for PN. And this study reported that the cost of providing one day of parental nutrition was approximately $229. Based on these costs, we combined each day of ICU stay with whether or not the patient received parental nutrition, whether or not they received mechanical ventilation, and we generated a large scale Monte Carlo simulation of a stochastic cost model. To generate 95% confidence intervals around these costs, this process was repeated 1 million times. This resulted in over 4 billion cost days. So based on this large-scale Monte Carlo simulation of a stochastic cost model, we found that early parental nutrition significantly and meaningfully reduced costs. For each patient who received early parental nutrition, total hospital costs were reduced by $3,000. So for every $1 spent on PN, $5 were saved in subsequent healthcare costs. So in summary, we found no significant harmful effects attributable to the use of early PN in this patient population. And when we consider costs, we found that there was a significant cost savings from reducing duration of ventilation and reducing ICU stay attributable to the use of early parental nutrition. Thank you very much for your time. This is our educational outreach website at the top of the page. You can find links to additional talks, more information on early parental nutrition, and also my email address. If you have any questions about this talk, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much.